second, I'm going to record. Hi, everyone. I am here with Abraham Abe Boger and Cheryl D. Holmes Miller, and we're recording an interview in advance of our Design the Future event on September 9th. We just wanted to give you all a chance to get to know these two wonderful people a little bit while we talk about Black excellence in design and other diversity and inclusion topics. Um, so Cheryl, do you mind just giving us a short summary of your amazing career that now spans many decades and tell us a little bit about your motivations and interests and things of that nature. Well, yeah, this has been, I'm a legacy visual artist. This is all I've ever done, uh, all I've ever wanted to do. Um, I started um, this journey when I was three. <laughs> oh, that's the only thing I can tell you. You say, well, how do you start a journey like this when you're three? Um, well, I'm a baby boomer, and I grew up with the transit media and technology transitional time of um, radio to television. And so television was fascinating, kind of like you're racing your kids on your iPad, and it's the technology of the moment. And there were things that were captivating, um, Walt Disney and animation, um, brand new color images from black and white, um, and then the whole moving from you know, show listening to radio to this six o'clock hour of seeing color and um, Walt Disney, the Mickey Mouse show. <laughs> I remember all this myself. Yeah, I yeah, did the black exactly, and right? white to color transition yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, so right there, it's like, oh, the, uh, the medium of visual arts came alive young and um, I had some formative exposure. Um, my, my parents had friends uh, one was a photographer uh, who became our family photographer. Um, and he was always around with six or seven cameras around his neck. And my godmother was a painter. And my father had a friend who taught art uh, in high school. And um, these were early exposures. And I decided then that I wanted to do this. And um, uh, so we, we had some connect to some people who were in our lives and I won my first award when I was 10, and uh, which was kind of exciting because I ended up on the, one of the section covers of the Washington Post and the Washington Star as a Girl Scout winning this art award. And from there, I think that's the place where I became um, engaged in um, not just wanting it as extracurricular, but really wanting to have a career. And so, um, you know, I just, I just journeyed through uh, to the civil rights movement. And my father came home one day and said, what's your plan for college? And again, this was another transitional period of when um, art schools were really making a transition from art institutes and they were being accredited. And I came home with a plan. I said, listen, they got this thing called art college. I can go study art and come out with an academic you know, degree. So, all of that was kind of new. And at the moment of the civil rights movement, I started um, college touring the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And uh, I took off to New England. I applied to three schools. Um, and this is the place where I stepped on the path of uh, design injustice and things um, that designers experience. So I'm, 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 old enough to know it all and young enough to remember it all. <laughs> okay. And That's so, a great expression. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a part of the history of it and mm -hmm. in the making of it and my peers, there just weren't that many of us. Um, there weren't that many in front of us. And, um, and I had a very um, prolific career in New York city. I, I started as a broadcast designer in the mid Atlantic. I always had an, an incredible, knack for winning awards. So if you look at my Wikipedia and all of that, I mean, it's my, yeah, my exposure has been endless through a time when it was near impossible. And so um, I started a career in Washington, D.C. as a broadcast designer, and I worked for three of the local affiliates. And then um, my husband's career brought us to New York City, and um, where I got so many experiences, so many stories. It depends on the interview. You can find different. I try to make every interview different because I really have journeyed through a lot of storytelling. And I don't really like to repeat 
myself. So I put all of them on a YouTube tube channel and I try to, you know, talk about different experiences. So each interview is, you're not hearing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, that's um, a good, good, good way yeah. to go. So with, with that said, New York, um, I tackled it. You know, you have to hear one of the interviews and it's involved of uh, how to break into New York and how I did that. But I wrote an, uh, a very inter interesting historical wave. A lot of people don't realize a lot of the history behind what we do see mm -hmm. um, when it comes to art and design. And I, I started practicing during a time where there was an awful lot of advocacy and pressure in New York City um, via practitioners, uh, business owners, uh, and using um, the NAACP and the Urban League and these facilitators of our agendas in African American community, um, there was a lot of pressure to integrate our images into what we saw in advertising. If you're going to take our money, um, we should be seeing you in ads. Representation. So there was yeah, there was, yeah, there was a movement that people don't know of advocacy behind all of a sudden, you know, um, black folks showing up in TV in the seventies. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, cigarette ads or McDonald's or as well, right? Yeah, there was a lot of pressure, and so with that, um, you know, I started practicing and uh, got a lot of corporate work that also parlayed um, double-sided coin. Um, I, I, I had a mission and a purpose to put, to help change and integrate corporate iconography in the corporate communications realm. I, I didn't do ads or sales promotion. It was just strictly um, the annual report and high-end mm -hmm. um, um, books and publishes, publications. And then um, in turn, I became an in-kind service so one client made two. So it, I would work for Fortune 500. And then if they sponsored an African-American corporation, um, they sent me over as an in-kind service to do corporate communications. So to enhance their image. So I had a lot of, of the national African-American organizations. Um, and I was a corporate sponsor. I went over, um, paid to go do all right, let's enhance, you know, your image. And so now when I look all of that and people, you know, have me talk and want to give awards and so forth, they've given me genre. I never branded myself, uh, but it's Cheryl D. Miller Design New York, New York, a corporate communications firm that defined the civil rights era, social impact, uh, corporate communications and graphic design. I didn't know that's what I was doing. <laughs> I was on a mission um, helping the community in this way. And it has created genre, and we were. Um, and now you're a legend. <laughs> well, the legend I think uh, came from uh, my advocacy, yeah. and along that way, um, you know, I became a trade writer and a very um, resounding voice. Um, I will never say that I'm the first and the only. Um, I want to give honor to those that, at least 15 years in front of me, there is a cadre of African American designers that were in New York City, and a. Uh, Another African American woman, Dorothy E. Hayes, um, kind of led the way. We called down south, um, priming the well, uh -huh. uh, and Print published her work and her friends. Uh, and she had some support from her Blue Valen, um, and they made a dent into our awareness that we existed. But we we were there, and her 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 generation is about ten fifteen years in front of me. Um, the difference between her mark and my work. Uh, I believe is really what's crucial and important about work going forward. She did what we call down south prime the well. Prime the well is you're trying to get water out of a pump and you're pumping, pumping, making awareness, awareness. And then somebody comes along and taps it. It's almost kind of like if you go to Carnival Cruise. I'm not a gambling woman, but if you're putting in quarters in the slot machine while you're waiting for the boat to dock and nothing happens and then you get up and then somebody comes behind you and puts in a quarter and you know, and so Dorothy and her generation did all of that awareness, got published. Um, and then I came along with a different, I came along with the same story, but a different key. And this is what I'm charging our, the community now to do. I came through with scholarship. And so my footnotes um, is what grew attention. The scholarship and my thesis from Pratt, um, I took the opportunity to go to grad school while I was in New York. Um, while I was doing the firm, another long story short, um, I got the thesis published. 
and print magazine. I've been writing for print now 30, 30 35 years since 1987. Um, and the reason, I, I really contend, the reason that my work has resounded through all these decades is because of the footnotes. It's because of the, it's because of the scholarship. And with that, um, the, um, the voice for the advocacy has some kind of platform. And so I'm really contending right now through here, I'm, I've got design history projects going on where I'm, I've collected, um, I've asked 40 of my friends um, across the generation age span to um, contribute to Stanford. Um, and we've, we are curating and collecting the history of black graphic design, which will be open source um, a lot of the history is oral tradition and be, and before Google. So you can Google and you're only going to see so many stories. And the, the young guys, the scholars that are writing now, they're, they're picking up stories from the 1900s. And, and there are stories that go way back that really just aren't Googleable. So I'm writing, I have uh, a major article coming out with print. This will be my third one. And I'm gonna tell you the editor has already, <laughs> the editor has given me some of the greatest kudos I've ever gotten um, as, as a writer. Yeah, the first update, Cheryl, this is, this is incredible. It's historic. And then that was Sunday night. And then last night or night before I got another letter from him, you know, law, this is, historic it's epic you know it's powerful and we're taking um well what happened is i i during this season i said i want to write about this one more time and um we we came up with an agreement for 1500 words and i ended up submitting fourteen thousand. <laughs> oh my goodness you wrote a book yeah yeah i did i did i actually did an ebook and so um it's really truthful I'm going to answer a lot of industry questions. I don't want to spoil it, but I, I, I stand on my findings. I give a full report on uh, where we are, uh, where we're going, uh, who's going there. And um, I'm, I'm hoping it, the last few conversations, um, they're going to keep the 14,000 and break it into three or four sections uh, and entries. So it'll be a series. Um, and it will join the other writings and scholarship. I, I've been a trade writer since the very beginning. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, well, that seems to be, um, that seems to be, uh, that's the nutrition of the experience that I'm a writer mm -hmm. um, and now a historian and that's and a nurturer of justice, right? That's, that's, yeah. And, and uh, when I look at the history, Bauhaus, you know, Bauhaus is a hundred years. I've lived two thirds of it. I've lived through two thirds of it. Mm -hmm. And I do feel a responsibility that given that I, I, I have the oral tradition and the memory um, and the knowing of the history, uh, that it's important for me to document it and leave it and to put it in a place where the scholarship can be done. And that's what I'm really hoping there that, um, that my work now uh, will inspire the scholars uh, because that's what it is. The, these, these young scholars, they've got PhDs with titles I can't even pronounce. Mm -hmm. These guys have to write and they have to seem you know, I, I, I'm just putting together footnotes for you. I'm, get, I'm putting together who you should go to. You know, I'm not, You're the unless, one with I'm, the unless I'm mistaken, unless I'm mistaken, I'm not going to be writing the textbooks. Okay. What I want to make sure is that I leave you the content and then I leave you the outline and leave you what you should be the, here. Look, these are your names. Go plow into this. Like right now from the article, these are my footnotes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. These are my footnotes. And wait, these are my footnotes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so for, one, for one article, which I'm going to contend to you, and I don't want to spoil it. I, I, I really don't want to spoil it, but I can tell you who the first black graphic designer is. Who? I, or I, I can tell you where, where he was in my life. Right. You know, and you can, so so in, my life, in my life, I can tell you the history of my black graphic design. Mm -hmm. The first one. Okay. Oh. And if you, can relate to my story, if you believe my story, 
then I would encourage you to adopt my genealogy to who and where is the very first black graphic designer and how it got morphed into this, oh my God, decades of where is the black graphic designer. You will be furious. When I tell you who he is and where he's been and what has happened oh. and why we are here with this conversation. Oh, no. So when I say it's a four part series with, with print, I say thank you. And I've got a lecture. Um, I'll be lecturing with the University of uh, Texas in Austin. Okay. I've got a, I got a lecture that goes with my findings and I'm working on a manuscript, another memoir um, that I'm documenting my legacy work through um, this pandemic. I've been in a forced sabbatical and, you know, life is fragile. And I really realized that, and watching the new young community coming, they're so hungry and we're, we're, we're going around like we don't know who we are. Yeah. Well, I know who we are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I got attitude. The whole time. I'm not, listen, I got totally attitude about it. Mm -hmm. Listen, I got attitude about it because I've known, I've known my whole life who he is. Yeah. And, and it was in, I know, it's fascinating. I've known my whole life. And all I can say is that in the beginning, Simon, of researching to write the article, it all, it all came together. Mm -hmm. And then all of the proof and, and, and what I contend, full of footnotes. <laughs> Who he is, where he's been, the core, the cancer of the systemic racism. Yeah. And so now my assignment, Okay, is what I what we call, you know, I'm also a theologian and you know, I'm I'm schooled out of Union Theological where we find Cornell West and James Washington and mm -hmm. James Cone and Dolores Williams, liberation theologians. I'm doing design systematic theology. And that what that means is when a system seeks to oppress and the shoes are too tight, you throw those shoes out. <laughs> and so and, and you correct the system. So now I'm into decolonizing, decolonizing hashtag everything. Yeah, All but right? you have a, a lot of support now. Now, Cheryl, yeah. I think we have to let you jump because you have another call at 12. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I have a 3.30. Uh, oh, at 3.30? Oh, we have a few more minutes. Okay, that's good. All right, so, perfect. So anyway, that's, you know, I'm, I'm practicing. I have a new, um, these new findings, it's not, that we didn't know. It's not that we didn't know. It's going to be the authenticity of my, of my, really my BIPOC um, life and journey. It's going to be, it's going to be the gene, the genealogy, my visual genealogy and DNA to being a visual artist and a designer. It's all integral. And to a historian. Yeah, and a, yeah, to, well, yeah, that that goes that goes with that go, that goes with it. But it's it's fascinating. I have a very very fascinating story. It's convincing. It's convicting. And like I said, um, when the article releases, um, anybody have any questions about it? You can believe it or toss it out. But I'm telling you, what what I'm contending is the absolute truth. And it's you all, of, will, be, of you all lived, will be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and your lived experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you will be completely like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And when I'm done with lectures and writing and all, then this is going to be in, no more going around the rodeo where the black graphic designers. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I know where they are. I know where they were. Mm -hmm. I know where they came from. I know you where they are. Where and they I, are. And yeah. I know where they're going. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you there so you much for sh that, Cheryl. I mean, you're just such an amazing, literally an icon of graphic design over these many years. And you've lived this amazing history. And it's just so cool to hear about it and hear yeah. about your work. And all I want to do is inspire, you know, there's some new areas that we should be doing as Black graphic designers uh, and visual artists. I want to inspire you to get that work done. And I think that um, a part of I thought I would never say this, but listen, all those folks that want to be scholars and things, we need to be professors at sophomore year, art, art colleges and universities. I'd like to see a, a cadre an, to ambush the, the um, sophomore year professor, because this is the place where you get your primary training. And this is a place where the minds are formidable and you can tell a truth. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to see 
an impact um, in uh, higher education with professors that you know are assigned to that sophomore year. And we don't, the kids don't see enough um, you know, uh, professors of color. And so if I thought yeah. there was an opportunity to forge and to move the needle, it's gonna be in the young professor that has the assignment of mm -hmm. um, introducing the sophomore to graphic design history and visual communications. That's going to be the, that's going to be the most important job to begin to create correct some of this because it's definitely cyclical. They keep rehearsing and giving the same baby. Yeah, food. <laughs> I think even at the high school level, you know, my son goes to a high school that's very social justice oriented, and you'd be amazed at some of the work and projects they do and the things they read about. And my son is um, also an illustrator, and um, he's very representative. He has always been like since he was, you know, seven years old. You know, he's he were mixed race part native but he he's blonde and blue dyed but he was always <laughs> including right and it was very impressive to see and he still does that and it's very natural it, for him he's not that. the problem it's the teachers, <laughs> the teachers well he has different. some good teachers, teachers though yeah the teachers where he's setting himself in place yeah that's the problem he's not the problem it's yeah the one, it's the system that he will find himself walking in is the problem okay yeah. I get and, that, and so the place to correct that is to make new leaders and you got to start them young. So, mm -hmm. you know, your, your kid could be, you know, a design leader and making, making a difference for the next generation. So that's why I'm saying right now, the targeted place is the sophomore year where the professional is being trained. Mm -hmm. And if we can get more teachers teaching mm -hmm. where our stories are told at the beginning, pri primer education, um, a lot of this eventually will correct itself. And so, you know, to have black students always being the only one, never seeing any um, professors of color being raised up by, you know, um, a, a Anglo Euro male centric design education by a male white male professor that's all you see and that's the only thing that's going on at the beginning of the sophomore that's year that's all you know how to, how to represent yeah, yeah yeah and it just keeps it just keeps recycling so you got to correct it sophomore year i'm after that's the sophomore like, year uh, i get you that's great yeah. well abe can we just listen hear from you for a few minutes before we wrap up because i'd like to hear your perspective on your journey um, as a user experience person with an interest in design research and all of this. So tell us your story in a nutshell, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Well, it all started with uh, joining the Air Force. And so I served, I was an airspace ground equipment maintainer. So I did a lot of work that was maintaining the equipment, of course, training people how to use the equipment, uh, you know, you know, helping other clients, which we had other people use our equipment, so I had to make sure that it was good to go. Writing up procedures, I'd imagine. Yep, mm -hmm. procedures and following procedures. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, I think user experience for me started when I was in that field. Like when I look back and reflect, I used to, you know, notice when people would do something wrong, skip a step, or, you know, try to cut, uh, basically try to cut steps, mm -hmm. I could notice where the faults in the equipment were. Mm -hmm. And so doing this, I, you know, from there we could just gather like all that data and then I kind of find out new ways to show someone how to use a new procedure or w find a way that we can teach them so they don't, you know, ruin equipment. So I think that was like my early, early UX uh, experience there, but I didn't really know what UX was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just knew I was fascinated with tech and I love seeing how people use equipment. Uh, my last year in, the, in active duty, I got to teach for a year and a half. Hmm. And so I got to teach, uh, you know, new new um, airmen, basically how to use the equipment before they got to their first bases. And so I got to, of course, monitor them, seeing how they do, you know, operate something under a given, you know, a given scenario, how their thinking was. And so it was pretty, you know, interesting and then so when i went to osu originally i wanted to do engineering which was yeah <laughs> that one was fun um but then i you know found out about user experience through college and um i had already transitioned out of active duty and i've gone into the air guard to do part-time and then uh i got introduced to user experience and then that's kind of like answered what i wanted to do 
right. because I knew in tech, I just love seeing how people use some use a product and like how they like how they use a product and how like, you know, it's about the original intentions were and sometimes don't align. Sometimes it's for their greater good, though, that, you know, like, you know, you have a product that's set to do this, but users find a new way to use that product to, for their benefit, which enhances the, pro the, you know, the usability of that app. So uh, doing that, you know, I did this for, you know, of course, you know, doing projects and such, I got to see how it actually, how important this field is. And that's kind of why I wanted to be in it because, you know, I just love seeing how when someone uses a tech, like for example, my mom uses smartphone all the time and I always watch her say, what are you doing? How do you do this? And I like to see how their, her thinking is compared to my thinking, you know? And so that's kind of, you know, I definitely want to be that person that can help make a mark into, you know, helping, you know, more users use tech. And well, user experience. experience is a hugely important part of design. A lot of times people think about design and they think about visual design yeah. and they don't think about the design of products and the design of products involves what you're talking about. We need to watch people using technology. We need to understand natural behavior and then we need to design technology solutions that um, take all of that into account and yeah it's a complex process you know we're spoiled when we see you know a software product that works really well or even a tv show or anything and we don't realize how much effort actually goes into producing something that's really high quality well i wanted to do this interview with you because um we are doing our event on September 9th. It's called Design the Future. We have a diversity and inclusion panel happening about midway through the event. Um, Abe and Cheryl are going to be part of that panel and we'd like to encourage you all to participate. We're also going to include links to Abe's work and Cheryl's work so you can go check it all out. Um, I'm so glad that you were both able to make the time for us to spend a little time together today. So thank you very much. And and I'm really looking forward to that panel on the 9th. I think it's going to be really great. And I think you made some great points, Cheryl, today that you should make again in that panel. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's the only story I have. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, well, thank you both so much. I really appreciate your time. And so we'll go ahead and wrap up now. And thanks again. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Nice meeting you. Night.